now we're probably finding it very easily. In fact, some Bibles might just flip open to it. My, my iPod automatically, iPad automatically comes to it. Uh, today, Paul is going to talk about boasting in the cross. And we too want to talk about boasting in the cross and what that means. Now, uh, I saw this and a friend of ours, uh, not a good friend, but a friend of ours, wrote a song. And the line of the song goes like this. One cross, two hands, three nails, four gifts. And that's the chorus of the song that he wrote. And so uh, we need to understand what does it mean then for us to be people of the cross, the culture of the cross, to be cross-training, if you will. I'm so glad to see you today. Uh, and how everything else fits in with boasting. Now, if I was to ask you, what does boasting mean to you? Who's got an answer? How many of us would have a positive answer? Most of the time when I think of boasting, I think of, my team's better than your team. My dad can beat up your dad. Uh, my mom can beat up your dad. Okay, so uh, uh, things like that. Now, how many of us, when you think of boasting, you would go, ooh, ooh, that uh, boasting in the cross, that almost sounds like the two shouldn't go together. It's sort of like military intelligence. And so you think, how can you jam these two thoughts or these two words together, boasting and the cross, and yet it does because it was the direct inspiration of God through the Holy Spirit to the Apostle Paul to us. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to Galatians chapter 6. And we're going to begin reading verse number 11. It says, see what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to become circumcised. And only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, Peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit and in truth, brothers and sisters. Amen and amen. Now, how many of us notice we're going to finish the book of Galatians today? We are actually going to finish this book today. Wow, it seems like it was just yesterday we got started. How many of us remember why we went to the book of Galatians? We have been starting with the Apostle Paul and studying the three missionary trips. And he finishes missionary trip number one. He comes back. They're about to go on missionary trip number two. And before they do, they get these uh, alarming uh, words that the churches in Galatia are a mess. And Paul says, before I can go do this again somewhere else, isn't it important to go back and fix what's broken? And so he says, before I can go start again, my heart just breaks. There is a need to fix what's broken. And that's where we pick it up today. We're going to be talking about the cross-centered life. He started off with the cross-centered life. He ends with the cross-centered life. Now, he says this, see with what large letters. Now, how, how many of us know that the older we get, the smaller we write? And that's a phenomenon. I don't know if you know that. But the older we get, the smaller we write. When we're children, we will write those great big letters. And the older we get, the smaller we write. Now, I know that that is somewhat of a, of a generalization, but that's generally true. Uh, I just write smaller so you can't tell how many words on this film. And so, the, and most of the time, it's just a couple of loops and a couple of lines, and a couple of loops and a couple of lines. Uh, you see, people with penmanship like mine, it is just uh, DNA that you become some sort of a doctor. And so, but the only person really that can read my penmanship is Margaret, and uh, I think she she can uh, read it because she knows what I'm thinking even before I put it on the paper. Okay, it says. Look at what large letters. Now, uh, large is this word uh, that means the size of the font. Uh, and most people believe, how many of you have seen the signature of John Hancock on there? And so he, he said that he wants 
King James to be able to read it, or the king to be able to read it without having to put on his spectacles. But did you know it can also mean large as in importance? Now, it's not necessarily going to be large, meaning length. Now, this is the first epistle. He has nothing else to compare it to for length. So we can't say this is large in comparison to my other epistles. He says, but this is large. Now, there is a lot of debate. I will say that uh, uh, Luther and, and Calvin believe in the second one, large as far as importance. I will say that Zwingli and, uh, and Tyndale and others believed in the first one, large as size is fun. And they argued a lot about that. In fact, some of the things that if you go to seminary, we don't necessarily argue about theology. We argue about syntax. It's called form criticism and text criticism. And a lot of times, if you don't agree with the way in which I form criticize, we can believe everything theologically and we'll cease to have company with people who don't believe that it's large letters versus large meaning. Why can't it just mean both? I mean, couldn't God have had more out of his mind than just the size of the hand penmanship and or the size of the importance of the letter. Now, we know that Paul's going to use this letter to write Romans. Everybody knows that this is a precursor to the book of Romans, where he expands on every single topic that we've already covered. And so he uses it as a, if you will, a syllabus as he writes the letter to Rome. Why did he write much less? Why did he write large letters? Well to authenticate the apostleship and the epistle. Remember, one of the first things that they said is, you're not an apostle because you weren't one of the original 11, and you weren't the one voted in when they voted in the next apostle. So you're really not an apostle. Now let's not forget, who is a disciple of Jesus Christ? The word disciple is matetas in the Greek. It literally means a student or a learner. So anybody who is loving God and learning about Jesus is potentially a disciple. Now, why would I say potential? Because, you know, there's a lot of people who study religion who do not love Jesus Christ. So they are boasting in who he is. Margaret's twin brother says he believes in the ethical teachings of Jesus. Now, what does that mean? That, that much of what Jesus said, blessed, blessed be, blessed are you, blessed are those, all of the Beatitudes. He says those are wonderful things to live by, but I don't give my life. So I'm not sold out for Jesus Christ, but he said a lot of good things. So, he, and, But he also says he also walks the red path, and he's also a Hindu, and he's also a Buddhist. And so anything that, in, anytime he thinks something is intrinsically good, it's okay. And he just mushes it all together, assimilates it all together. Paul is writing this to authenticate. Now, it says, in my mind, that they had to recognize his penmanship. Have you ever looked at some penmanship and you said, Oh, I know who wrote that. I know that's hard because Margaret also <coughs> made a teacher that kids won't put their name on their paper anymore. But she can look at how they write their answers and say, oh, okay, this is this person, and okay, this is that person, and okay, this is this person. But when he says, see with what large write letters I am writing to you, it is to authenticate, which means they must have known what his membership looked like. I don't know exactly what his membership looked like. I have not seen the original photos or the autographs. But I do know this, that he believes that with large letters he is authenticating the size as well as the depth as well as the writer. Now he does this in several other places. If we were to take a look at 1 Corinthians 16, 21, it says, and with my own hand I am writing to you. This is, you know, a lot of times when you would say, well, this is a uh, hot box, right? This is the only time. That, but then, you know, he also says in Galatians 4, 15, that with my own hand, I am writing to you. It says in 2 Thessalonians, and let's look this one up, in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse number 17. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of the genuineness in every letter of mine. So how do I know that he was doing this to show that he was authenticating his epistle? He tells us so. I am doing this to authenticate the genuineness in every letter of mine. He is going back to Galatians and going forward and saying that he closes out the letter in his own penmanship to show that he really was the one. Now, they had a thing called an amanuensis. And that person's job was, as Paul would dictate, they would write it down. But more than a stenographer. And most of the time, for most of the letters, the amanuensis was Luke. 
Has anybody ever heard of the disciple Luke? Anybody remember what his occupation was prior and then even with Paul? He was a medical physician. He was an MD, a doctor of their day. Highly, highly educated. And so uh, I think another reason is because he had incre incredible penmanship. Now that goes against all of our doctors of today, but it does authenticate that Paul says, I am writing this with my own hand. Let's go back to Galatians. We have been studying that there has been a battle of the flesh versus the spirit. We have been studying uh, the battle, and the flesh is this way, but the fruit of the spirit is this. And the flesh wants this, but the spirit of God wants this. Now today, we go from the battle of the flesh versus the spirit to the flesh versus the cross. You see, that's the next step up in the battle line. See, with large letters I am writing you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to become circumcised. In other words, Christ is not sufficient in and of himself. They were not saying you don't need Jesus, but they were saying that's not all you need. You do need Jesus and, 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 and trying to bring them right back into Judaism. Now, it would authenticate their Judaism. And they're saying they're flesh. And so it says, and they're doing this so that they may look at verse 13, may boast in your flesh. In other words, they want to be able to boast to say, yep, I flipped him. Yep, I flipped him. Yep, I flipped her. Yep, I flipped him. Yep, I flipped her. So in other words, once somebody came to Christ, the way that you can get good graces in the Judaizers is to be able to authenticate that you flipped people back from Jesus right back to what Jesus saved them out of. And they want to boast about your flesh. In other words, they're keeping a record in names. Okay, flip this one, flip this one, flip this one, flip this one, flip this one. And it says they don't really care about you. They care about themselves and their list. They care about themselves. For the flesh does not want to be the persecution of the cross. Now let me just say that when you take a look at this little phrase, that they don't want to be under the persecution of the cross... There is a lot of debate about this. But I see it as this. Much debate meaning this. They were trying to teach that Jesus was okay as a teacher. But if the cross was true, he was the divine lamb of God, the Savior. And all through the whole Old Testament it says that when the lamb of God comes, he is all you need. So they had to just make Jesus to go back to being just a rabbi and not be the divine lamb. Because if the cross of Christ was true, they are now under persecution of the very reason why he was on the cross in the first place. So they were saying, oh no, he was just a rabbi. He was just a rabbi. A good rabbi, but just a rabbi. Because if they claim the cross to be true, they had to claim Jesus to be more than just a rabbi. He had to be what? The divine Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. You see, you can't call Jesus rabbi without calling him Savior, or you're still not saved. You're still walking in Judaism. He goes on to say this, but far be it from me to boast. Now, here we go again. What can I boast about? It says he is going to boast in the cross. Number one, the thing that I can boast in the cross is, is first of all, we are all sinners. We are all sinners. We can be saved by grace, but we are all sinners. Number two, sin renders us under God's judgment. What did Jesus, uh, Jesus say? And I do believe it was Jesus who walked with Adam and Eve in the garden because he is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. What did, he tell, uh, what did he tell Adam? That you can partake of everything in the garden except for. And he says, when you do, there will be death. Now some people say, you will die. And both of those is true. Now he didn't mean on the spot. But he did mean what? No more paradise. The intention of paradise would have been continuous forever. But when and if you will die. You will die in relationship with me, and you will die in physiological relationship to the world in which you are living.
and nothing in the world had died. Can you imagine that? Uh, uh, Carol comes over and works on our plants because we keep trying to kill them. And she keeps trying to come over and revive them. In fact, there's been a couple of them. She said she's going to have to dig up and move someplace else. And the first thing I thought of was, I thought that was a good place to plant that. <laughs> but obviously, see, um, I, I will plant it to die. She will plant it to live. And when I go with my plan, it usually brings death. But if I go with God's plan, it always brings life. Always brings life. But he says, when that day happens, there will be death. And remember what happened on that day? That God killed an animal. And it was a blood sacrifice. And it is a picture of the blood sacrifice that would come, which would be his one and only son. And after Jesus' death, we don't need another blood sacrifice. We've got the one, the perfect blood sacrifice. But since we are sinners, our sin had to be judged. God's not just going to all of a sudden say, ah, oh, it's okay. Now. I will say that that's a very popular teaching in the world today, and in many churches today, that you may go to hell for the next thousand years, and then God's going to change his mind and just say, okay, you've suffered enough. Come on in. It will never happen now. Please don't let anyone do you in believing that you can just live for self and in a thousand years from now, you'll get to go to heaven. God will judge sin. And either he will judge the sin on Jesus because you came to him, or he'll judge the sin on you because you didn't. But one way or another, all of our sins will be judged. Nothing we can do can pay the price. You, you know, uh, I've had a lot of people ask me, if, when something is happening, what can I do to make it up to you? Have you ever had anybody ask that? What can I do to make it up to you? They'll even say this, uh, how can I pay you back for that? Now, we can look at God, and, God and, and say, what can I do? And what's God's great answer? Take my son. I have given you the option. I have given you the freedom. It, it, it's so simple that anyone can do it. And yet it is so difficult for some because what does that mean? I've got to humble myself. I've got to call myself a sinner. I've got to believe in God's judgment. And I've got to realize that I can't do anything about it in and of myself. All I can do is what? Boast in the cross. Boast in the cross and what it can do. Number four, we must have the cross and only the cross. Now he says this, for even if I boast, I boast in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ. Now some people say we all have our cross to bear. Anybody ever hear that phrase? You hear it all the time. Now let me just say, God's never called you to bear a cross. He's called you to get into a yoke, but he's never called you to bear a cross. Cross is an implement of death. He has never said, I want you to die. I want you to go be martyred. We may be martyred. People are being martyred around the world. They are saying as many as 300 people a week in certain places are being martyred. Did you realize that? 300 people a week? Uh, anybody see the orange... Wearing orange uh, program that's out of have never heard about this. There are some churches in the United States that are asking people now to start wearing orange. And when people say, well, why are you wearing orange? It is in remembrance of the orange jumpsuit of Christians that was taken out and beheaded on the, on the shorelines. It is to say this is a sign of solidarity. Some people all go weird. Some people all shave their head. Their thought was, well, let's all wear orange. Um, I can't say that you need to do that, but I'm going to say, don't think that it's it's too spiritual. Jerry is wearing orange today. So if Jerry was to see somebody today and they were to say, oh, I like your shirt, he says, he could easily say, reminds me of the martyred Christians. How about you? Do you care about the martyred Christians? And next thing you know, you've got potential witnessing. But it can't be just your cross to bear. Jesus says we are supposed to pick up our cross and follow him daily. Now, what does that mean? It means that in this world, you will have tribulation. But God is not calling us. Every single one of us to be hung on a cross. His cross was sufficient for every single person. But we may have tribulation in this world. Now, boasting in the cross, it has to be the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it goes on to say that saves us from our sins. Far be it from me that I would, verse 14, Boast except for in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, which the world has been crucified. 
The cross not only saves us from sin, the cross saves us from the world. Now, I don't know how many times I've heard people say this. Well, I just, I just can't stop doing that. I just can't break that habit. According to this, Paul is saying that the cross not only can save me from my sins, but I can crucify the world through the power of the cross. What does that mean? It has no effect on me. Have you ever heard somebody say, you're dead to me? You're dead to me. Now, what does that mean? We uh, pastored in New Mexico. There was a girl in our little town. Now, how many of us think you know what it means to live in a little town? Anybody? This town had about 75 people in it. Let me just tell you that when uh, we still had those party line telephones, that when you picked up the phone, you could hear somebody else's conversation. And every time you made a call, everybody else in town could listen to yours too. And so we lived in a little town. And this girl got saved. And then she came and she said, uh, with tears, my family's having a funeral for me. I cannot get saved and stay in this town. She had to move. You see, what her family says, that if you leave our faith and you go into the Christian faith, you're dead to me. They have a funeral for you in many places. And they, that means you can't come over, you can't talk to them, you can't have communication, they will not have communication with you. You have been excommunicated from the family because you have been crucified to them. You're dead. And what is he saying in reverse is, is once the cross saves me from my sins, it then gives me the power to say, the world is crucified to me. The world is dead to me. Now, how many of us are still slaving away for things in this world when the world ought to be to enjoy, as it says in John 10, but also to be crucified? How many of us can't live without? Can't do without. Can't go without. I was talking to someone the other day, and we were talking about a current television show that's on. And they said, oh, we don't have TV. And the first thing I thought was, what do you mean you don't have TV? <laughs> I mean, how do you watch ESPN? I mean, I, think, now, now I know certain people in this very room could say, I, I have limited TV. But they have no TV. No TV, except for uh, the movies that they rent, and they <clears throat> pick everyone on purpose. So in other words, the movie industry is dead to me. I will control what comes into my house. That's what this is talking about. In other words, swearing is dead to me. In other words, all of the things that we think we can't break out of, in Christ, through the cross of Christ, I can boast of the fact that through him, I have the ability to crucify the world to me. It's as if it doesn't exist. But he goes on to say this, that the cross makes us a new creation. Look at verse number 15. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision. In other words, if you choose to circumcise, great. If you not, you choose not to circumcise, great. It is not the, the circumcision of the flesh that matters, but the circumcision of the heart. He is saying, the cross makes us a new creation, makes all things new. Now let me just ask, when somebody becomes all things new, do we have the right to remember all the old things they did? God says he doesn't, and yet I still do. Now let me just say, that doesn't mean that you just can't lodge and give them your bank account. Is that right? You don't just all of a sudden say, here, take my car. They still need to earn back some respect. Is that correct? But that doesn't mean, but it also doesn't mean that we hold them accountable or set them up for failure. Now, this is what I have seen happen. I've seen people become a new Christian, and then people say, all right, if you're really a new Christian, then you gotta do this, and you gotta do this, and you gotta do this, and you gotta do this to prove it to me. Now, wait a second, you're not God. I mean, that church is telling people that. You've got to do this, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do this to prove it to us. In one particular church, you were not allowed to be a member uh, unless you came to the church for like six months. I think even without missing. And then after you became a member, you weren't allowed to have any position in the church for like the next two years. 
couldn't do anything but attend and tithe. And then when we asked them why, and this is what they said, because they haven't proved themselves to us. And my, and my question for them is, who made you God? Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible says, don't be quick to lay hands on anyone. But, but it never says, all right, here is the timeline. Once they start coming, six months later, it's okay for them to apply for membership. And two years later, it's okay for them to possibly be thought of that they might be able to work in the ministry. Shouldn't that be up to God? And then we will see the proof. We should not have to demand the proof. Now, let's face it. If somebody says, I'm a new creation, I'm a new creation, and they just continue to do all the stuff they were doing before they claimed to be a new creation, I would have to say, ooh, I'm not judging this person, but I am saying that maybe you need to have a break in some of your things. And isn't that what he said in Galatians 6.1, where it says, if any of us is spiritual, anyone that sees one of our brothers and sisters caught up in a sin that they can't seem to break out of, we who are spiritual are supposed to go and encourage that person and lift that person up, help that person break that off so that they may grow into the fullness of Christ. Our job is not to say, nope, nope, nope. Our job is to go out there and say, let me help, let me help, let me help. We're supposed to assist them. So the cross makes us a new creation and gives us an opportunity to start cross-living, not just cross-bearing. Now, this is what I want to call it from now on. When Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, he is not saying, go to be a martyr. He is saying, live the life that you have been to the cross. Live like you have been to the cross. Now, if we go to the cross, we see Jesus high and lifted up, go, oh, that really breaks my heart. And then we walk away. We're not living the cross, even though we experienced it firsthand. Cross living is bearing peace and mercy. Take a look at this. For neither circumcision is anything except for the new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule. Now, what do you think another way to say walk by this rule might be? You start cross living. You start living like we're talking about. And so those who walk by this rule, it says what? They will have peace and mercy upon them. I was reading some F.F. F. Bruce. Anybody ever read any F.F. F. Bruce? Incredible writer. And he says this, that when you are cross-living, the breath of God breathes peace upon you. It says that as we fix our minds upon him, he will keep us in perfect peace in Isaiah 26. It also goes on to say that as we focus our minds upon him, that we will have the peace that passes all understanding. Now, is, is it because I just instill peace within myself? Or is it because God himself breathes peace upon me? Now, remember, peace does not mean the absence of problem. But it does mean the presence of him in the midst of the issue. And no matter how bad it can be, we can still be at peace. Uh, Margaret and I went in to pay our uh, county taxes the other day. Anybody ever do that? It's, it's a joy. It rakes right up there with uh, root canal. Uh, but we went in to pay our, our county taxes, and this is what they told us. Your house is on the auction block and will be auctioned off in September. That's what they told us. And so sure enough, our house was on the auction block and was going to be auctioned away from us this September. Unless, well, there was a problem with the way in which the financing went through, the way in which we, yeah, you know, some of us have, you know, your house payment, part of it goes to the county taxes, and part of it goes, ours didn't go. And because ours didn't go, they put us in default. And because it's a teeny tiny little part print, we didn't know. And it was going to be auctioned off. Let me just tell you, uh, we did not say, yippee! But we did say this. Only God can work this out. And then we had to say, now how can we get involved with him? You see, when we say the peace of God will be breathed upon you, that doesn't mean you just sit back and say, okay, send me, send me money. It still means that we still need to do everything we need to do to try to rectify the situation. But we don't all of a sudden just go nuts over it. Now we went a little nuts over it, but I will tell you that you don't go completely nuts over it. 
was talking to Dave the other day. How many of us know? How many times have you had your identity stolen? Five. Five times. How many of you would go nuts over that? <laughs> First of all, everybody wants to be Dave Beebe. That's what that says to me. The whole world wants to be Dave Beebe. Uh, but you know, they're trying to buy a new house, and in so doing, they had to do some things. And, and so, but sure enough, in this process, what happened the other day? Somebody's trying to refinance their house as me. So he's buying two houses. Wow, ambitious now. Go check out their house and see if this one's like <laughs> See which one you like. I wish it were good. Yeah, no. Dave sends me a text. And there's smiling faces and there's all kinds of And I'm thinking, that's exactly what cost living looks like. Hearing the worst possible news you could possibly hear and still be able to say, in Christ I can do all things. Because he will give me strength. And even if you wouldn't have caught him. I still think they would have had a, a loving attitude. And I'll say this, that even if they would have auctioned off our house, we'd be living with money. <laughs> uh, well, now that I know that, that Dave's going to have a pool, it'll either be with the Katrinas with the pool or with Dave with <laughs> So we'll find somebody who has a pool in the backyard and we'll just move in with y'all. Uh, cross living means that, that you have mercy and peace upon you. Upon you. And notice it goes upon the Israel of God. That means there ought to be mercy and peace inside the church too. So when we're all living individually, collectively calm and in, in peace and mercy that God has breathed upon us, we, we have a collective calm. But did you know that it only takes one person to go bananas before everybody else starts going bananas? And if you don't believe that, have something go wrong in front of the kids. And have one of the parents go, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what we're going to do. And the kids will be affected. Even though the other parent and the older kids are all come, that all it takes is one to agitate, and it can agitate up everything. Number six, cross-living may bring stigma. Uh, how many of us know what stigma, the word stigma is in the Greek? It's literally this word for marks. For he says, for let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the stigma of Jesus. It's a word there for displays of beatings. Physical scars. Now, a lot of people have asked me, what is the scar on my forearm? And that's where I ripped my bicep off. And so it just snapped off and coiled up like a snake right up in that area in there. And so I've got a stigma. Now, most of the time when we think of stigma, we think of eyes. Is that correct? We'll think of something wrong. What is a stigmatism in an eye? Anybody know? You don't see folks. It's the shape. And, and so because the shape of the eye has been elongated, it, it doesn't allow us to be able to see things, and it won't allow the eye to flex. And so when you have an astigmatism, anybody ever go into bifocals? I went into bifocals in one day. I was up reading one morning, and all of a sudden, um, the words that I could read yesterday, I couldn't read that day. And, and then you do this, you go, and you flex your head. <laughs> I've seen people do that, so I'm not the only one that does this. Have you seen people do this? Well, they'll either do this. And they'll pull the book farther and farther away. And then they'll flex their head. Okay. Uh, did you know that your eye actually flexes? It is a muscle, too. And so it flexes, which brings the, the optics in and to focus. But guess what happens as we get older? And it can sometimes happen as we get younger, too. The eye is like a rubber band. Now, what happens when you pull a rubber band too many times? It loses its elasticity. So does your eye. And it'll, it'll flex to bring that, and then it'll release and it'll come in through, and then it'll go out of you. And it'll come in you, and then it'll go out of you. Then you get vertigo. <laughs> Cross living brings stigma. It brings marks. Uh, people can say they don't want to be with you anymore. But that's when we've got to be able to say, the cross has saved me from there. Now, that doesn't mean that I just say, okay, Paul, if you don't want to be near me, then, you know, you're dead. Now, we still have a responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel to the very people who stigmatized us. You get that? When they were nailing Jesus down, one cross, two hands, three nails, what did he say? Four. In other words, the very people who put the, the marks on him were the very people Paul was going and trying to still continually try to reach. And then what does it do? It allows us to evoke grace. Now, let me just say, I wrestled a lot with how to say this one. Uh, 
Uh, Margaret is uh, a walking thesaurus. But look at verse number 18. To the very church that has, churches that has been giving him so much grief about you're not an apostle, we can't trust your teaching. In verse number 18 there, in the last verse in Galatians 6, it says, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now wait a second. What allowed him to say, I know you have mistreated me. I mean, God's grace be mine. You see, when we have the breath of God giving us grace and peace and mercy, we can talk to the very people who have stigmatized us and say what? We can evoke grace to them. What comes out of us when we are crushed? Grace. Grace. John Piper says it this way. Can everybody read that? It says a cross-centered life is a cross-exalting life. It is a cross-saturated life. It is a God-glorifying life. And it is the only God-glorifying life. All other lives are wasted. Well, that's a pretty bold statement, huh? Pretty bold statement? So in other words, I can't say, well, I'm really not into cross-training today. Now, I know a lot of people in here really hold John Piper with a lot of high respect, as do I. But notice what he says, and I agree with him. A cross-centered life is a cross-exalting life. That means, Jesus said this, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in the sinful and adulterous generation, of him will I be ashamed when I come in my Father's glory. A cross-exalting life, if somebody was to say, are you a Christian? Well, I kind of go to church. Yes, I am. And what are they doing in the Middle East right now? They're saying, yes, I am to death. Because it would be more important to honor God in death than to dishonor him in just life. So a cross-centered life is a cross-exalted life. It's a cross-saturated life. In other words, everything I do centers around the cross. If I play ball, I play ball for the glory of God. If I play music, I play music for the glory. If, if when I go to work, I go to work for the glory of God. Now, I may go to work and do different things, but I don't have to be the pastor of a church in order to be cross-centered in my job. I'm cross-centered because I'm cross-centered. And he says, it's the only God-glorifying life. I believe that too. Let's not waste our lives. Because the way we waste our lives is to waste our moments. And the way we waste our moments is that instead of being, say, the world is crucified to me, I say, I care more about the world than I care about. Now, next week, we go on mission again. And so that's where we're going to start again next week. We'll start here in Antioch. We'll go across. We'll come all the way around. We'll make our way all the way down to Caesarea, come all the way down to Jerusalem, and if you notice, make our way back and end up at Antioch again. So we're getting ready to go on mission trip number two. But before we go on mission trip number two, what did Paul have to say? I am an apostle. This is God's word. It is Christ alone that saves. And it is a Christ-centered left that changes you. To be able to say, the world is crucified to me. To be able to experience the peace that passes understanding. So that when the world puts stigma upon you, you give grace upon them. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this book called Galatians. And Lord, uh, we have lingered here for a long time, and I pray that it would not have been in vain. That we have seen something, heard something, encouraged us to dig a little deeper. And now as we go continuously now with the Apostle Paul and now with Silas on their continued missionary journey, Help us to realize that we're on a missionary journey as well. We may not be walking across the Middle East, but we might be walking across the exact place that you have given us for such a time as this, for us to be able to share forth and boast in the cross. And may we do it with passion and power and grace and peace. And as we do, may Jesus Christ be glorified. And may the people we come in contact May they be open and may we reach them with the only, only message that will be able to save their soul. Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and come. Be with us on mission today and all this week until we come back again. In the name of Jesus. Now before you
just get up. If you'll remember, about a year ago, I gave the opportunity for people to have a timeline of the apocalypse.